Picture a middle-aged man, outstanding in his field, a successful leader. Yet, when his mother comes to visit, he returns to childish ways. Maybe it's the home-cooked meal, but something made him revert. And especially when his mom said, okay, so honey, what mass are we going to go to? Are we going to the morning mass? It's like, mom, do we have to go to church? It's so boring. She said, of course you have to go, son. You are, after all, the archbishop. (laughs) Yes, mass can be boring at times, even for church people. Sometimes the ritual becomes routine and turns into complacency. Even when we try sometimes, we want to get something out of Mass. But once the reading starts, the speaker starts droning on, one goes into a state I humorously call a pious coma. Wait, what happened? A loss of consciousness occurs until the reader says the word of the Lord, and we snap back to reality and say thanks be to God. It's questionable in Catholic parlance. Does thanks be to God mean thank God it's over? Before 2012, the translation of the Missal, the book we use on the altar, this red book here, the only translation given from the Latin, the translation was, the Mass is ended. And then the response is, thanks be to God. It really does sound, thanks be to God, the Mass is over. So Mass can feel boring. It can be hard to understand what is happening to keep our attention. So why go to Mass? Why does the church insist as a precept, and sometimes our own mothers checking in, make sure we go to Mass every Sunday? Why? There are many aspects of the Mass that we can examine. The Mass is, first of all, a connection to God. God who is, by definition, beyond our understanding. So it's okay to be confused and not fully grasp what is happening. But there are many aspects of the Mass. The Mass can also be called the Eucharist, the Liturgy of the Eucharist, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, the Lord's Last Supper, a community meal, a community gathering, worship, a presentation of the Passion, Death, and Resurrection of our Lord, the real presence of Jesus on the altar. All of these are true all at once. So it is okay to say there's something complex happening here. It's like a finely cut diamond twirling in the sun, every turn giving off a different sparkle. It's multivalence carrying different layers of meaning, and some of them in paradoxical tension with others. It's complex. But we have the ability to reason, making complex things simple, learning a piece at a time, one concept at a time. It's what we do at university, right? Your professors are presenting topics. You try to get it. Okay, we're going to have an exam over this. You take your exam. You're stressing during midterms, like, oh, I don't get this yet. I don't get this. But slowly by slowly, that understanding comes. We should be able to break down the understanding of the Mass in the same way. For that reason, I will offer a presentation this week in the Lumen Lecture Series, covering the different aspects of the Mass and examine why we do what we do. In that presentation, I'll explore in the Mass, first of all, why is it called the Mass? Anybody know? If you already know, you don't need to come to the talk. Anybody know why it's called the Mass? Okay, that's it. If you want to find out, come Thursday, 7.30. Today we'll address why go to Mass. God reveals in the scripture today that it is a celebration, a festive meal. God says in that first reading from the voice of the prophet Isaiah, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples a feast of rich food and choice wines. The reading goes on to amplify it. Juicy, rich food and pure choice wines. The Lord says he'll provide this for his people on his holy mountain. The Lord revealed this to the Jewish people. For them, the mountain was Jerusalem. The city is up in the hill region of Israel. You literally had to go up to Jerusalem, go up the mountain. And then the highest point in the city is where they built the temple to encounter the Lord. So literally you're looking up to the temple and we go up to the mountain as God asked to worship. And God said, on this mountain, I will provide a feast for all peoples. Notice the revelation through Israel. 
God says in the Old Testament, it says, why did I choose you, Israel? Because you were the best nation, the biggest nation, the most important. No, you're the most insignificant. But I chose you to teach my people how to have relationship with me as God. And so we learn from Israel, learn from the Jewish people about this relationship. But that relationship is supposed to be a light to all nations. All nations, this blessing is supposed to go out through the Jewish people. So Jesus came as a Jew living among Jews, worshiping God as a Jew, teaching the Jews in a Jewish manner. The way he taught today, he's talking to the scribes and elders, and he uses parables to give stories back to them, to teach them that right relationship. And Jesus' teaching then has become a blessing to all nations. Everyone is invited to this feast, but also the requirements that it takes for this feast, namely to change one's hearts. God wants to change all human hearts. Everyone needs it. Jesus says this parable, the kingdom of heaven, this is what it's like. It's like a wedding feast. It's like a feast, but a wedding feast for a king's son. Perhaps he's amplifying that image. You can imagine the celebration of a king and for his son. And he's probably kind of applying this now to himself. It's like a feast for a beloved son. And of course we hear that many turn down the invitation. I'm too busy, I can't go. And so already foreshadowing this our human nature. Why don't we go to mass? Oh, we let other things distract us. But otherwise, it also takes preparation to come to the celebration. We can see it in the example of wedding celebrations. We all know, have you been invited to a wedding? You go, when I was in college, I didn't get to go to many weddings yet, but I got invited to one wedding, and I said, wait, what? I have to bring a gift? I don't have any money. Like, I had to save up and figure out a gift. Like, I didn't know. I have to get dressed. I don't have any suits. I don't have, I had to scrap together some clothes. I had to scrap together some money. It takes a lot of work to go to a wedding celebration. And then you have to kind of sit through the ceremonies, even the speeches that happen. You're like, but in the end, those speeches are an invitation to bring people in, bring people into the celebration. I'll just say a, a side once, the biggest wedding I ever went to was in Africa. I was studying as a seminarian in Kenya, and my Dominican brother said, come on, you're going to come to our village and see a traditional African wedding. It was a multi-day event. Talk about a lot of work going to a celebration. Multi-day. All these ceremonies were happening. We weren't allowed on the property unless ever something was exchanged and this. And someone was offended. And there was, oh, there was all kinds of rituals going on. I was like, what is going on? After two days of that, sometimes not understanding in Swahili, sometimes in this and different. I was exhausted. But then the celebration started. Finally exchanged all these things, invited their guests to celebrate in the joy. They came processing the time to cut the cake. But in the, at least Kenyan and style, it was not a cake. It was the roasted goat. The roasted goat, it looked like a cake though, all decorated, roasted carrots, roasted celery on it. And the chefs came with two poles, processing in, and everyone had that procession, like that joy before you cut the cake. And they were chanting, cut the, and they cut the, the meat and served, the wedding couple served each other and said, now we're going to serve all our invited guests. And it looked like a communion line. People came like this and they fed from the goat, they fed a taste of the morsel to each guest. And then the wedding party started. The dancing and everything, all that preparation turned into absolute joy. That that preparation changes us, we're invited into the joy of the celebration. Mass is supposed to be like that. We come, we prepare. Beautiful, our beautiful musicians took all this time to prepare things, prepare the readings, prepare the church, decorate, and you all come dressed up, coming on a Sunday. Of course, it's a university setting. Some students come in their flip-flops and everything like that, but we're trying our best, put our best foot forward. We come in this preparation, and God's promise that there will be a rich banquet a food of rich food and choice wines. And what do we provide in this altar? Thin, tasteless wafers. A Dominican preacher from England in kind of a snarky English manner says the first act of faith 
is that this wafer is bread. But it's a simple, unleavened bread. And that real act of faith in that bread, in that thin wafer, in that humble thing, Jesus becomes present. Jesus takes that bread, blesses it, and breaks it. In a moment, you'll hear the Eucharistic prayer. In the past tense, this is what Jesus did. And suddenly, the Eucharistic prayer turns from past tense to present tense. Jesus gives this to you today. He invites you into that celebration. In that bread and wine, he becomes present. The wedding feast of the Lord. This feast, then, we just see from that thin wafer, is not necessarily about the food. St. Paul says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I would define righteousness as being in right relationship with God and with one another. Jesus invites us into the celebration, but requires us to change our hearts. We don't have to be, he said, everyone's invited, good or bad alike. Everyone comes, even those that are doing good in life. A lot of people say, why should I be Catholic? Why should I go to Mass? I'm a good person already. And you know what? Not everyone that comes to church is good. Guess what? Everyone's invited. But all of us have to change our hearts. Even our own goodness that we have, don't rely on yourself. You become a Christian when you're good, not because you doing it, not you forcing yourself. You give up and allow God's spirit to transform you. God makes us in that special being, not relying on ourselves, good or bad. And so that rich banquet nourishes you that transforms you, like that thin little wafer becomes a rich blessing, and so are you. That's why C.S. Lewis said, of all the people coming to church, the church is like this family coming, you know, the church says, here comes everyone. Literally, here comes everyone. So you never know the people that you're rubbing shoulders with. C.S. Lewis says, at Mass, next to the Blessed Sacrament itself, that is the Eucharist, that thin wafer hope become Jesus. Next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. That is why we go to mass, to help us celebrate the kingdom of heaven and to realize our dignity, who we are, and the dignity of our neighbors. C.S. Lewis said, it's a serious thing to live in a society, to come in this community, a possible God's and goddesses. Isn't that a powerful statement? C.S. Lewis said, you are possible gods and goddesses. I didn't quote, he also said, we're also potential devils as well. We could go either way. We always have that opportunity. But possible god and goddesses. You're gonna hear the ending prayer today of the mass. The mass says, by this Eucharist we have received, by what we have received at this altar, that we may be in his likeness. That is Jesus. You are possible God and goddesses because Jesus transforms you into his very self. In this Eucharist, just as the wafers transformed into this rich banquet, so you are transformed into that child of God, into Jesus' very presence himself. May this Mass then help us open our eyes of our hearts to the spiritual banquet, though we're not unworthy to enter such a banquet. By confessing our sins, we ask Jesus to clothe us, to give us his love. After the consecration of the Eucharist today, the celebrant holds up the Eucharist and says, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. We confess our unworthiness, but invite that blessing into our lives, our community, and in our world. Let us receive that blessing of God, that we may be filled with his love and his peace. Amen.